Welcome to Mooney Reads. Today I'm going to be talking about my favorite fiction books from 2023. This was going to be a top 10, but really it's more like a top 11, plus several special mentions throughout the video. Um, so who knows how many books are actually in here, but these are some of my favorites from the year. Um, I will be talking about this while crocheting my book blanket. Um, this was, uh, this is meant to record all of the books that I read throughout the year, um, with some exceptions. I might make a video on it. We'll see. We'll see what happens, how I feel, etc. Um, at the moment I am in October. Um, I actually, I filmed my 2023 recap slash 2024 plans video. It was on, um, the same book actually, but I've, I've added a fair amount to the book, um, so I'm not going to feel too bad about it. But anyways, I am going to go roughly in order from like, you know, all the way towards number one. So the last one I'm going to mention is number one. Um, but like with all of these tiered videos, if I were to have made this on a different day, different books would be in different locations. Um, because I liked a lot of them and I have a hard time picking favorites, which is why this top 10 video is going to have like 14 or 15 books in it. So I'm going to start off with a couple of the special mentions, actually. Um, the first book that I wanted to mention, despite it not technically being on my top, um, is Patricia Wants to Cuddle by Samantha Allen. And this is a kind of a wild book. It's a mix of like, a, it's a romance that turns into a slasher but there's also a cult in it. Um, and despite part of it being a slasher, there is a romance in there that ended up making me cry. So there's a lot of things happening. Um, and it all takes place on the set of a dating show, like the bachelor style dating show. Um, it's wild. I think I might've given it like, a 3.75 and it, is, it was a little below a four star mostly because of just some technical things and parts of the story I really did want to like hear more about like I think the most compelling some of the most compelling things I, I wanted more of but yeah if you're into Bigfoot cults slashers or the bachelor style dating shows um it was really cool it was really wild. The other special mention that I wanted to put in is The Twistwood Tales um, by A.C. McDonald. This is a little comic collection. Really a lot of these could be read individually or you can do what I did and sit down and read the whole thing. It's very cute. Uh, the cover is really autumnal and it it does go through all of the seasons but the artwork and just the spooky cozy nature of it still gives me fall vibes but I think the blurb that my co-worker gave to it that made me want to read it was something like um gravity falls meets over the garden wall or something like that um I've only seen a little bit of gravity falls but I really like over the garden wall and I think that is a very valid comp um and it was super cute there um uh, or a lot of cool little things um a lot of cute friendships and they there is creepy stuff but it's not too dark it's very cozy very cozy i loved it with that we can get into my actual top list um and the first one which i think is number 11 um i have when no one is watching i listened to this on audiobook towards the beginning of the year and I was sort of tentative going into it because I don't really read a lot of, um, like, kind of genre mystery thrillers. So I kind of didn't have, um, you know, a whole lot of expectations. I'd heard good things about it, but I just didn't know if I would like it, just give, given the genre. Um, but it was really good. Um, I had mixed feelings about the romance that was in it. Alyssa Cole, the author is a primarily a romance author from what I understand. I have not read any of her books, but after this, um, I intend to, uh, despite not really liking the romance in this, I think that 
like I could see her other books it being more compelling especially since I think she has some queer ones but um uh the mystery element was really good and I like how history ties into it and plays a role the main premise of this is that the main character lives in a neighborhood uh that is being gentrified um and as kind of new people are coming in what's happening is that the neighbors who were originally there are disappearing so the main character is kind of looking into that and is looking more into history and some things start unraveling yeah this really exceeded my expectations and then at number 10 i have the charm offensive which um i also primarily listen to on an audiobook <laughs> related to patricia wants to cuddle um uh, this is based around The Bachelor. This year I also watched a season of The Bachelor. Of course it ended up being the season where The Bachelor ends up being gay at the end of it. Um, but this book, The Bachelor figures that out while he's on The Bachelor. <laughs> or finds out that he, or falls in love with a man um, while he's on The Bachelor. That's the premise. It's the uh, the main guy and one of the people on set. It is really cute. It also has some really good mental health representation. Um, uh, one of the characters has depression um, and the other one has um, OCD and some pretty severe anxiety and I think uh, seems very autistic coded. Um, that's just my personal opinion. That's not really representation but I... Uh, uh, that's you know very very autistic coded to me i think i did have a couple of like small issues with some of the stuff that happened at some point towards the end of the book but honestly it was just really good and i'm super excited that there's a christmas novella that goes with it um so i'll definitely be reading that i think i may have actually initially put the charm offensive as number nine and not number ten but it doesn't really matter because we're here now so number nine or possibly 10, they're very hard to compare because they're not like each other at all. Um, I have Little Fish by Casey Plett, another one that I listened to an audiobook. Um, and this is more of a literary fiction that focuses on a trans woman who's having to go back to her conservative hometown because um, one of her grandparents dies. And... Uh, so you're kind of seeing her life. Uh, she's very messy. She has an alcohol problem. Um, but she's also learning these things about her um, granddad, who has been dead for a while. Kind of the possibility of him being queer uh, in some capacity. Um, this was a really interesting exploration of grief. And there were just a lot of really cool nuances. I also love a messy queer novel. Um, so it was really good. I, um, like I said, I listened to it on audiobook. It was earlier in the year and it is one that I'd probably like to reread. I definitely want to read more things by this author. Next on the list, I have Feed Them Silence by Lee Mandelo. So last year, Summer Suns by Lee Mandelo was my favorite book and, or I guess in 2022, um, this author's other book was my favorite one. I read it twice. Um, it was amazing. This one is also very good. It is a lot shorter. Slightly different vibes, although both of them are very dark. This is a piece of climate fiction. The main character is a... Oh, I need to make sure I'm not giving this too many things. One, two, three, four... Completely unrelated to the books. I just looked at the page count. Uh, whatever the hell I wrote down was certainly not the page count of the actual book. So um, I'm going to be frogging like a whole row of this. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun for me getting to read that in a different color. Um, anyways. The next book on the list is Feed Them Silence by Lee Mandelo. Now, Summer Suns was my favorite book the year that I read it. I've actually read it twice. 
and it's just fucking incredible. I really liked this book, um, even though it wasn't Summer Suns, but I d wasn't expecting it to be. Um, this is a climate fiction novella that focuses on a scientist who is studying the last remaining wild wolves. Um, she is engaging in this new technology that is basically making it to where she can put her brain inside the brain of the wolf. And she becomes, like, really attached to this wolf at the same time as her marriage with her wife is falling apart. Messy queers, uh, really unhinged things happening. It's really bleak in terms of climate fiction, but it's really well written. The, um, like, the, the main character isn't <laughs> likable in a lot of ways, but it's still very interesting. And the parallels throughout the book on multiple levels um, are really good. So it was just a really, really well done book. Um, if you can handle bleak climate fiction, I would definitely recommend it. So after that, we have Bitch Planet, which is a comic series that is a dystopian where women who basically break, I mean, laws, obviously, but any sort of social convention, um, can get sent to a prison planet, bitch planet. It was just really good. This I read on the same day as, um, several other just really good graphic novels, I think during the Rent Readathon. Um, and, um, uh, I was a little bit tentative just because the premise of it could lend itself to some gender essentialism and the like, um, but it ended up being super good. I really liked a lot of what they did with it, and I am only upset that they don't have a third volume yet. Um, so, very good. In what I'm pretty sure is spot number six, I have The Moth Keeper by Kay O'Neill. And I've read one other K. O'Neill book, and it was cute. You know, it was Princess Princess Ever After. Gay princesses and knights. Adorable. Um, I didn't really know what to expect with this, but it was so... Like, it was very healing in an unexpected way. I, I adored this. Um... It focuses on a society that is nocturnal. The moon spirit gifted them these moths uh, that help their society in these various ways. And the main character is training to be basically a shepherd of these moths, the moth keeper. It focuses on her. And I don't want to say too much about the plot just because it's so short. But the way that everything works out was so healing to me. Personally, um, I, I just loved it. I bawled like a fucking baby. Um, it was amazing. The characters are also all very queer coded. Um, and the main character's best friend is, uh, disabled. I think uses, um, a walking aid. So, yeah, it's very good, um, middle grade graphic novel um also on top of all of that the even down to like the color palette that they chose the, the color palette is just so comfy um so this was like a warm hug that you didn't know you needed that you end up like sobbing on the person even though you didn't realize you were going to maybe this is a unique experience to me i don't know it was very good Highly recommend it. Very, very cute. So, um, book number five on the list is going to be A Minor Chorus by Billy Ray Belcourt. I originally listened to this on audiobook and liked it so much that I needed a copy. Um, this focuses on a um, queer indigenous PhD student who is trying to write his first book. Um, but is experiencing writer's block and basically goes to his hometown to interview folks for this novel. So a little meta with the novel writing um, and several stories within a story. 
Um, so we're getting his story. We're getting the story of um, the people around him and a lot of really good themes about community and connection um, and indigeneity. It was so beautifully written. Like I said, I had to get another copy. I was making um, tabs on the audiobook, which is does not happen very often. Um, it's really beautiful, and it is a shame that I've not read Billy Ray Belcour yet um, before this. Uh, he's one that's been on my list because I've heard nothing but just really great things. But this year was the year that I finally got to it, and I am super excited for the rest of his, um, why was I going to say discography? That is not what we're doing right now. This is not music. His other books. I'm excited for the other books. We're moving back to graphic novels with my next one, um, with The Infinity Particle by Wendy Zhu. Um, this is one of the authors of Mooncakes, which is super cute. Um, and I actually read, uh, their other book, uh, Tide Song, which was their middle grade graphic novel that was really good, very creative, and I wanted to be able to mention in this video too. Um, I really love kind of the lore. I really love the, the details of the thematic stuff is escaping me right now, but I did really enjoy this. This is her most recent YA release, which focuses on our main character who moved to Mars in order to study under, um, uh, this professor that she'd been following for a really long time who focuses on AI. This is very far into the future. So the questions that they're asking about artificial intelligence are very different, I think, than they are now. Different ethical questions. Um, much more interesting ones, to be honest with you. Um, and they do kind of reference stuff from this time in it, which I thought was very um, cool. But the bulk of the story is really about um, abuse and trauma, dealing with trauma and um, getting out of and coping with abuse. It is so beautifully done and it's hard to talk without spoilers, so I probably won't say too much about this, but the way that this was crafted and the way that all of this was handled delicately, but also, like, in a very moving way, I just really loved everything about it. Um, it, it was an incredible book on a day with a lot of incredible books <laughs> that I was able to read. In spot number three, we have love after the end an anthology of two-spirit indigenous queer speculative fiction um this uh is an anthology obviously i just read that um and with things like anthologies and collections um they can sometimes include stuff that are pretty hit or miss I actually read several anthologies this year and I did like a lot of them, but this one was just so good. Like there was maybe one or two that were like, okay, none of them were bad. None of them were bad. Multiple I wanted expanded and I plan on looking into several of the authors. The person who edited it, I've had um, Joshua Whitehead stuff kind of on my radar of books that I want to get or read for a while, but reading that, the, the introduction to this made me want to jump right into his nonfiction. Um, it, yeah, it's just very good. I thought that the collection as a whole is very um, creative in terms of the ways that they saw what the end looked like. There's also a lot of themes of things uh, being cyclical, so beginnings as well as endings, a lot of different types of queerness. There's just a lot that was really incredible. It's one that I'm going to continue to think about, probably revisit, um, and definitely see more from the people who are in the anthology. In spot number two, I have 
Dear Mothman by Robin Gow. Um, this is a middle grade told in verse. Um, I did not expect a middle grade to be on my top list. I haven't really read a ton of middle grade, I feel like, in the past. Um, although I guess it tracks, like, um... The Witch Boy series is technically middle grade, and that one was really good when I read it, but I didn't read as much YA this year, but middle grade is just really, uh, has a lot of cool stuff going for it, but this particular one, um, the premise of it is our main character, who is, um, an autistic trans boy, recently lost his best friend very suddenly, and, um, this is him writing letters to Mothman, who his best friend believed in. He's trying to find Mothman, but he's also contending with the loss of his friend, um, things around his gender and coming out, and also the difficulty making friends. It's written primarily in letters that are poems, um, and the parts that aren't letters are still poems. Um, but this was so beautiful. I, you know, I said, I cried like a baby when I read The Moth Keeper. Um, really I cried with several of these. I'm, I'm a Pisces, so that's, that's just bound to happen. But like, I can, I can barely talk about this book, just the way that it talked about grief and everything was just really, really beautiful. Um, and I thought that, and there were certain aspects also that I thought were cool that I can't really talk about without being spoilery. Um, but this was really great. Um, and I'm sure that it's going to be a really wonderful thing for a lot of kids too, especially who are, um, experiencing loss or having trouble with making friends and things of that nature. In spot number one, I have Skin and It's Girl by Sarah Cipher. This I originally read as an audiobook, but obviously it was so good I needed a physical copy. Um, and it was one that, like, I'd seen on maybe, like, a couple of lists, and I was looking for an audiobook, and it happened to be available. So, it was one that I really did not anticipate, and I ended up loving. This is, um, a queer family saga written from the perspective of a woman who is talking to her great aunt, who is one of the three women who raised her. Um, she was born the... Uh, the narrator, the main character, starts at her birth. She was actually born and proclaimed dead, but then came back to life and was blue. And that's kind of the place where we start at. Um, this weaves together her story along with the story of her mother, her great aunt, and her grandmother, um, as well as pieces of Palestinian history. And these basically folk tales um or mythologies but they're uh more based largely around their family and a lot of them the great aunt makes up so you're getting all of these different types of stories and at certain parts they intermingle and mix and it kind of has that effect with time at a certain point as well it is just such a beautiful story and i'm finding that i really like family sagas which I feel like I keep, like, learning about myself and then promptly forgetting. This happened when I found the Carrying and Keeping of Ravenously Hungry Girls in 2020. Um, and really, when I think about it, a lot of other books that I really like are family sagas. Um, Sing Unburied Sing, I also read that same year. That was a family saga that I really enjoyed. Um, I would argue Detransition Baby is a family saga. Um, I don't know. Lit fic family sagas are just a thing that I should read more of. And middle grade. A completely, completely different, um, vibes going on here. But, I mean, not completely, actually. Because she is, um, this whole thing is narrated to her aunt after her aunt has passed away. When she's trying to figure out kind of what to do at a, a pivotal stage in her life. So there is a component of grief not just grief but kind of um contending with what you did and didn't know about certain people 
Um, yeah, I don't know. It was really wonderful. So those were my, uh, favorite fiction reads of the year. Um, hopefully I'll be putting up my nonfiction reads soon as well. And in the comments, let me know if you've read any of these and, um, tell me about your favorite read of 2023. Thank you all so much for watching. Bye.